All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nathan Stoll, and I'm the chair of VLab. VLab is an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit. For 30 years, VLab's connected innovators, investors, experts, and curious minds to explore disruptions near their inflection points and discover insights from founders before their household names. Tonight's event focuses on disruption around the transition to a clean energy future uh, and poses the, the question of can carbon heavy industries like concrete become carbon friendly? In a moment, I'll introduce our moderator to explain more and introduce our panelists. And first, a few words of thanks. Uh, first, to all of our donors, many of you made donations tonight. Thank you for providing the support we need to run the organization. And second, to all of our volunteers. Without you, there are no events. Special thanks to our programs chairs, Ravi Prasad and Shyland, and our marketing chair, Bob Galino, and operations volunteer chair, David Hamm. Your work uh, helps this organization move forward every day. Uh, I'd like to share a dear tribute, uh, sadly, to our VLab board member, Aiko Fushida, who passed away on Saturday, October 24th. Aiko contributed greatly to the VLab mission over these past decades, and she was full of heart, encouragement, and a great friend to many within the VLab community, and she will be missed greatly. Our volunteer event team tonight, I'd like to tell you just how proud I am of the work you've done to bring this panel together. It's been a long journey and you've done an amazing job. So huge thanks to Shannon Fume, our chair, Bill Paceman, our co-chair, and Kevin Chen, Tito Jankowski, and Sunil Sethi. You've done an amazing amount of work and I'm so excited for our panel tonight. So I'm excited to be able to introduce our moderator, Marcus Extivore, the executive director of the Carbon X Prize. Marcus has worked for decades at the intersection of science, policy, education and technology development. He also leads XPRIZE's energy, climate and environment work. He combines his experience in partnership building and strategy with his training in physics and engineering to help lead the transition to a clean energy future. And without further ado, Marcus, please take it away. Thanks so much, Nathan. Um, thanks again to the organizing team. You've done a fantastic job. Um, been looking forward to this event for a long time. Uh, we were delayed a little bit by the events this year, the pandemic, but here we are finally, and uh, the timing is actually perfect. Um, I'm especially interested and excited to be moderating this panel today. We have uh, four fantastic speakers that are really at the cutting edge of probably one of the best, if not the best examples of this idea of using CO2 for beneficial purposes, um, recycling CO2 into valuable materials, carbon to value, carbon tech, circular carbon. It goes by a lot of names, but the idea is turning this CO2 liability into an asset to try to not just defensively attack the climate problem, but actually recognize that there's a huge opportunity here to remake our economy um, and remake some of our key industries. Now, where the focus for today is concrete, um, I'm going to start by forgiving everybody that's, that will inevitably switch the names concrete and cement in their minds uh, or during the panel, I may do it as well. It's a natural, uh, it's a natural slip. We're talking about concrete, um, the hard stuff, not cement, the powder that holds the hard stuff together. Although cement uh, plays a crucial role in this all too. Before we get really get into the topic of concrete, what does it make to embed? What does it mean to make CO2 from concrete or embed CO2 into carbonaceous materials? Uh, I just love to frame the topic in the broader context of climate, climate innovation, and then sort of actually using CO2 emissions. W what are we talking about here? Everyone here is familiar with the climate challenge, and you all know it's driven by excess greenhouse gases. Um, CO2 is of particular focus because it's so abundant um, and so persistent. CO2 is very stable. That's why it hangs, long, hangs around for a long time. Hold on to that stability thought because it's relevant to concrete. Now, we are at a time where more and more we're hearing about net zero commitments, drawdown commitments, and various ways to mitigate our global CO2 problem. I think you can think about the universe of a possible solutions to dealing with CO2 in a few different buckets. And I've sketched them out on this slide here. We can reduce our CO2 emissions today. That means emit less stuff. That's things like switch away from fossil fuels or switch from one fuel to another, drive less, increase efficiency, et cetera. 
all those things reduce emissions. We, of course, need that more and more as soon as possible. What we're really talking about today is more about reusing, benefic beneficially reusing CO2. Um, the, probably the leading example here is in the drinks industry. Next time you have a soda, that's possibly reused CO2 uh, or could be. Number three is really the use of CO2. That's recycling CO2 into another value added product. Um, and I think concrete fits squarely there. But there's another important point here, and this is removal. I think our panel will probably get into this, but locking CO2 molecule into, let's say, a carbonate that lives a long time inside of a concrete, uh, an element of concrete, uh, can, re can result in a permanent removal of CO2 from the air or the oceans. And I think that's really the holy grail. It's not the only way, and it doesn't mean other interventions aren't valuable, they are. But it's important to recognize that we have a CO2 problem because we've fundamentally taken too much CO2 from the Earth's crust in the form of fossil fuels and other things, and transferred a whole bunch of it over the last few centuries up into the atmosphere and oceans. Removal is about taking some of it back, even as we engage in those other one, two, and three. Okay, what I'd love to do now is just sort of quickly get from here to how do we get to talking about uh, maybe a new concrete industry made of uh, based of CO2. This is a plot you've probably seen before. It shows where the CO2 and greenhouse gases come from. The point of the plot is that they don't come from just one place. They come from many sectors of the economy. It's not just about the cars. It's not just about the buildings. It's not just about our power sector. The CO2 is everywhere. It's coming from everywhere. The flip side is that means there are opportunities to apply the types of solutions we're going to talk about today in many sectors of the economy. I want you to hang on to that concept. This isn't just about power plants. This isn't just about buildings. This is an opportunity for many sectors of the economy. Um, pick your favorite company that's made a net zero commitment, locate them on this chart. Um, and maybe after this uh, session today, you can start to ask yourself, you know, is there an opportunity for them to use concrete or to participate in a concrete and a CO2 concrete movement? This is a, look, I'm a physicist from another life, so I've got to include a science slide. This is a, actually from a science magazine, a nature magazine paper published almost exactly five years ago. From left to right, it shows how you can chemically transform a CO2 molecule, there's a cartoon of CO2 molecule on the left, over to, in this case, methane. And the point they're trying to make here is that you can do it, you can rearrange the molecules, you can break the bonds, you can add atoms, subtract atoms, and it takes energy. The line, the arrow at the bottom of the slide going left to right is meant to show, roughly speaking, um, higher energy content of the molecule. That energy had to come from somewhere, which means you have to add it to the system. Traditionally, people think about converting CO2 into other stuff. And an immediate question is, well, where are you gonna get the energy from? And it takes quite a bit of energy and is it all worth it? I'm pointing this out because the discussion for today, one of the reasons concrete is so interesting is that the energy flow can go the other direction. The carbonates uh, that can be the basis of a CO2 concrete or aggregates or many other solid building material compounds um, is energetically favored or thermodynamically favored, meaning you can go downhill energetically or use very little energy to make that transformation. This is what sets um, the building materials, the carbonate, the concretes apart from many other examples of CO2 utilization or carbon tech. So keep that in mind. Uh, I will go back one slide. Uh, I won't get into the details, but I want you to focus on the size of the circles. Big is better. This is an estimate of the climate impact of turning CO2 into different materials by McKinsey, uh, um, coordinated by the Global Center, Global CO2 Initiative, published about three years ago. They looked at a few different materials noted in gray, aggregates, fuels, concretes, methanol, polymers, et cetera. The big circles are next to aggregates, fuels, which we won't talk about so much today, and concrete. Point being, there's a lot of climate impact here, a lot of climate potential because the size of the market is so large, but also because of the chemistry of actually taking CO2 and embedding it uh, in these aggregates in concretes. So the climate impact is significant of CO2 concretes. Going back a slide, the market opportunity is also significant. This is analysis by Carbon 180, a great NGO in this space. They looked at what is the total addressable market. That's the TAM, the TAM they're referring to. Not what could happen in the future, but in 2017 dollars, using known technologies, using known material markets, what's the total addressable market? Across all materials, 
that the answer was around six trillion dollars. Uh, the if you can, it's a bit of an eye chart, but if you zoom in or you download the full report, you can see building materials accounts for uh, roughly a sixth of that. I think. Um, let me zoom in. Yeah, roughly a sixth of that. Fuels is also a huge segment, but uh, building materials is significant. That includes concrete and aggregates. So there's real climate impact. There's also real uh, financial or business impact or business opportunity here. Again, that's part of the magic of this particular space, not just to battle climate, but to do it uh, in sort of an economy uh, forward way. Uh, look, this is a couple of bits of data. I'm going to zoom through these because I really want to get to the discussion. This shows the number of companies formed over time in the sector, not just concrete, but all companies taken together. The key takeaway is it's going up. Okay, it starts about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and it's going up. Um, and we see this trend really continuing. There are more and more companies being formed and more and more activity in the space. What was once considered a relatively sort of strange and niche corner of the climate impact and tech world, I think is growing in significance and interest and importance. The second piece of data I'll zoom through is uh, a bit of a snapshot of the investor landscape. Um, and I think we'll get into this in a bit more detail in our conversation, but where is the money coming from? Uh, this is survey work that we did actually at XPRIZE through our Circular Carbon Network Initiative. Uh, it shows that government is still the leader, which you would expect from early stage technologies, but corporate strategics, angel investors, venture, even private equity and other uh, players in the capital stack and in the private uh, and the commercial capital space are starting to move in. They're not just kicking the tires anymore. They're st we're starting to see deals executed. Um, some of those are represented uh, in the room today, I'm sure. So there is real interest here, and I think an opportunity to continue to grow the space even further. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Brent Constance, who's going to uh, give us a bit of perspective uh, of his from, as founder and CEO of Blue Planet. Before I do that, I just want to throw in this last slide. So this is, I, I work at XPRIZE. I manage the Energy Cosia Carbon X Prize, which is a global competition to try to develop and support technologies in this space and really grow the space by bringing investor attention, public attention, et cetera. Um, this is our old branding. So if somebody asks me about this after the fact, I'm gonna deny that I showed this slide, the marketing people will kill me. But the point is when we launched the prize almost over five years ago, this is the branding, some of the branding we came up with and they used a brick. Okay, it's a red brick, it's not exactly concrete. But the point is, there was this idea of you know, ethereal CO2 turning into a solid building material. We really didn't know what the market was gonna look like uh, five years down the road, but we just had a sense that building materials would be really important and that turning conch CO2, a colorless, odorless gas into something literally tangible um, and solid like a brick or an aggregate or a concrete was not just a really interesting climate solution, not just a really interesting um, uh, business opportunity, but also kind of an interesting, almost magical thought to share with uh, the broader world that you can take a gas and turn it into a solid, dura a durable solid. Um, so if you can excuse the fact that these are red bricks, probably made of clay and not concrete, uh, just sort of interesting how much and how important the concrete and aggregate space has become. And I think actually has a ton more uh, room to grow. With that, I'd love to just close that background. I hope I've whet your appetite. I'm gonna hand, um, control of the slides, but also the the, uh, the floor over to Brent and ask him to give us some of his perspective. Uh, once we hear from Brent, we're going to actually open it up to the rest of the panel. We'll introduce the rest of our wonderful speakers. We'll get into a bit of a conversation. A last shout out to the audience before I turn it over to Brent. We're really interested to engage you and get a lot of questions and input here. Think about your questions during Brent's talk and start to submit them through the Q&A function. And we'll use that throughout the rest of the uh, the session. So after about 10 minutes, we'll get to the main panel. But for now, Brent Constance, founder and CEO of Blue Planet. Over to you, Brent. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Marcus. That was a wonderful introduction to the area, and I really appreciate uh, all your help in launching my subject. Um, it, it Blue Planet, um, our strategy is to turn CO2 into limestone which is 70% um, of all the aggregate used in concrete is already limestone. So it's one of the largest mass material markets on earth. 
over the last couple of decades, um, most of the focus on concrete has been on looking at ways to reduce the carbon footprint of concrete by replacing Portland cement, which is the principal CO2 generator in concrete. And um, what, where we're at now though, is, is a whole different idea. The idea, instead of just trying to lower the carbon footprint of concrete by lowering the amount of cement in it, is to ask the question, how much CO2 can we permanently sequester in concrete? So if we capture CO2 from a whole bouquet of different CO2 sources, from the atmosphere itself to cement plants or power plants, how much of that can we actually sequester in concrete itself? Now, concrete is the most used building material in the world. It's pervasive, it's everywhere. So it's, it's available and all the infrastructure to support it is all over the world, anywhere where there's people. And the aggregate component of concrete is about 80% of concrete. The cement is about, about 15, 10, 15%. So one of the greatest opportunities is to replace that aggregate, that limestone aggregate uh, with synthetic aggregate that's made from CO2 that otherwise would have uh, entered Earth's atmosphere. Um, it, it's interesting that uh, other than water, mining of rock is the most um, largest commodity on the planet. Uh, there's over 55 gigatons of rock mined and um, moved every year uh, and all the logistical systems are in place. So the, the possibility of capturing CO2, turning it into aggregate, and instead of going to open pit mines and transporting rock very long distances, uh, it opens the possibility of creating rock from CO2 where the CO2 is being generated. Now, let me say that um, if we look where the carbon on Earth is, there's about 750 gigatons in Earth's atmosphere. There's about 5,000 tons in Earth's biosphere. There's about 40,000 tons in Earth's hydrosphere, meaning the ice caps and rivers and oceans and lakes. Uh, but there's about 50 million gigatons of carbon in the lithosphere, almost all as limestone, a little bit as coal, keratin, and other hydrocarbons. So already, back to Marcus's point about stability, almost all Earth's carbon is already in limestone today. So it's one of our greatest levers is to put CO2 into limestone. Now, next slide. The organizers asked me to mention just something quickly about technology. And Blue Planet was founded on a, a very important discovery that just about all carbon on earth has gone through a pathway of being absorbed through the ocean, equilibration of the atmosphere with the ocean uh, to form carbonate. And um, this discovery enabled us to identify, and what you're seeing is a scattering pattern here of 100 nanometer, uh, my cells or uh, a liquid phase within another liquid phase, which is used in biomineralization, like the mineralization of a clamshell or a, a lobster skeleton uh, in, in very short order. And it turns out by this discovery made by one of our PhDs, we're able to condense and uh, mineralize CO2 very rapidly akin to native processes. Uh, and we call this a liquid condensed phase. It's interesting, uh, like carbonate ions, for example, that will normally go through a membrane, when they're condensed into these tenth of a micron sized phases, which happens naturally and can be modulated with ions, um, will not go through a membrane. It can be isolated and condensed. Next slide. Uh, and through this coalescence, uh, we can form limestone in a process that normally would take a long time in a, in a matter of minutes. Um, and 
so this is the natural mechanism which most of Earth's carbon actually goes through because all limestones are simply the skeletal remains of marine organisms like corals, et cetera, the White Cliffs of Dover and the Great Barrier Reef. Um, the, uh, um, so going on, that's a basis of the technology and I'm happy to answer any questions about it uh, going forward. If we go to the next slide, the, um, just to, as Marcus pointed out, just to re-familiarize everybody, if you forget, concrete is the marketed product and it, it's composed of other things like water, aggregates. We talk about fine aggregates and coarse aggregates, meaning sand and gravel, supplementary cementitious materials. These are materials used when you remove Portland cement, cement itself, uh, which is the principal CO2 generator and chemical admixtures. And um, recently, Blue Planet, uh, for instance, um, has announced a, a major partnership with Mitsubishi Corporation, who will be building Blue Planet uh, plants all over Asia, for example. We have other partners and other continents as well. But one of the principal aspects in um, real incentives to build these plants is not just to capture the CO2, but is to really transform the whole built environment, which again, concrete is the most used building material in the world and uh, into the place where we're storing uh, most of the CO2. And when you mineralize CO2, uh, similar to the normal biomineralization process and form limestone, it's permanent. It's not like refining CO2 into a liquid and trying to inject it and prevent it from leaking out. It's actually permanent sequestration in the mineral. And remember the scale, this is the largest commodity other than water in the world. So in terms of mass material movement, if we're gonna sequester uh, tens of billions of tons of CO2, it's really one of the only places we're gonna do it. And certainly the only economically uh, favorable place to do it where there's an existing market. So to, to give you a, a better understanding, I'm going to show you a new rating system similar to Energy Star called Carbon Star, which is actually used uh, to quantify how much CO2 you've sequestered in concrete. So the built environment not only becomes a positive in terms of a, a place to store CO2, but it's profitable and fits in with the future of society. So if we go to the next slide, um, what you see are what are called mixed designs. So every, every concrete truck that goes out has a different mixed design. And on the left, this is a, a mixed design that would be something that would have been poured in the 1960s or 1970s. And it consists of coarse aggregate or gravel, fine aggregate of sand, cement, which is Portland cement, which is where the carbon footprint is, and water. This cement, this mix has to attain 5,000 PSI in three days and have a certain consistency. Um, it has a, a carbon footprint or a carbon star rating of almost 600 pounds per cubic yard. So if I'm pouring 1,000 cubic yards of concrete, it's 1,000 times 600 pounds is the carbon footprint of my project. Now, on the, under, under the carbon star rating, the CS rating, you can see that aggregates have a zero rating. That's because there's a threshold of, you know, we consider the transportation of the aggregate and all the things that could lead to a carbon footprint are, is insignificant. But what is significant is the carbon footprint of the cement itself. And here, this plant efficiency shows uh, it produces about 0.6 pounds of CO2 per pound of cement when it's produced. So there's 890 pounds of cement at a 0.67 ratio gives us 596 pounds of CO2 in this cubic yard. So that's, that's sort of the control, typical cement. Now up into the lately uh, on the right here is a mixed design that would be more typical of what you might see today in a very aggressive formulation. Here we have this, the coarse aggregate or gravel, we have the fine aggregate, but the cement, which is the main CO2 causing component is uh, cut in half, 445 is half of 890. 
And instead it's been re replaced with slag and fly ash, which are waste materials. And this brought the carbon footprint down to uh, about half that, almost 300 pounds. Now this is traditionally what we've been doing over the last few decades is trying to remove the cement, which is the big carbon footprint causer to, to, and replace it with waste materials, which are now in short supply because of this. If we go on to the next slide, um, on the left is a mixed design where the gravel, the coarse aggregate and the sand, the fine aggregate are made by Blue Planet. And something about limestone is it's calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is 44% by mass CO2, permanently sequestered in the crystalline state as CO3. And so all of the aggregate component of the concrete here is from Blue Planet, from captured CO2 that would have otherwise gone into the atmosphere. And its impact, the coarse aggregate is negative 310 pounds of CO2, which is the 44%. And of the sand, it's negative 460 pounds. Again, 44% of the mass of the, CO, of the limestone that was put into the mix design. And now this concrete is carbon negative. It's 180 pounds carbon negative. So if I'm pouring a thousand yards, it's a thousand yards, not times 600 pounds, but a thousand yards times negative 180 pounds. So now I'm sequestering a, 180 tons of CO2, you know, in a, in a 10,000 yard pour. So it's quite significant. On the right is another progressive new idea, which is to take liquid CO2 that's been captured and purified it's actually infuse it into the, the, uh, the molten concrete. And here, uh, you know, it's using the regular aggregate, the regular sand, the regular cement, but they've removed some of the cement because their, the additive is a CO2 injection of 62 pounds, which allows them to remove some of the cement because the injection of CO2 allows it to cure faster. So here we, we have 550 pounds of CO2 coming from the cement, minus 62 pounds from the CO2 that's been injected in. And this has a rating of 488. Um, if we go to the last slide, um, here we've put all these interventions together into one, a single yard of concrete. So we have the Blue Planet aggregate, we have uh, reduced the Portland cement in half, We've injected CO2, we've used the slag and the fly ash um, as a, uh, you know, as a replacement of the Portland cement. So this is the idea, and I hope I've given you insight as to how cement's formed by going through these numbers. Thank you for following along with me on that. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Brent. Um, really appreciate that. Um, it's always helpful to Sometimes we talk about these things in the abstract, but I really like how you laid out um, some of the numerical balances to show exactly where the savings can be and what the what the different constituents of the product can be and how we can attack each of those. Okay, at this point, I'd love to bring more voices into the conversation. We have a fantastic panel that spans um, academic work, industrial partnership, uh, commercial activity, business, and investing in finance. You've heard from Brent Constant, CEO and founder of Blue Planet. Uh, I'd love to also welcome Tom Schuler from Solidia, another fantastic company in this space. Jeremy Gregory, uh, Executive Director of the Concrete Sustainability Hub at MIT. Welcome, Jeremy. And Arvind Gupta from Mayfield Fund. Um, now, welcome, gentlemen. What I'd love to do is give you each just a short moment to uh, introduce yourselves. Um, I think part of our format is, you know, no super long intros, but I'd love to give you an opportunity to just give us sort of one minute on um, who you are, uh, your organization, and you know, maybe an opening thought before we get into a bit of conversation. Why don't we start with Tom, then Jeremy, um, then Arvind. Tom, go ahead. All right, thanks, Marcus. Tom Schuler with Solidia Technologies in lovely Piscataway, New Jersey. And uh, you know, I, the only thing I think I'd, I'd like to add to Brent's comments that for consideration is, you know, to get these guys to really move quickly, um, we have to focus on how much all this stuff costs. 
Uh, if we're able to find a way for these guys to make more money in the process, and Marcus, that's why I thought your comments early on about you know the value of CO2 and our ability to actually transfer it from kind of a problem into a solution uh, is really, we think, one of the keys to our success at Solidia uh, and really the key to these kind of technologies being adopted quickly uh, within the industry. So I'm looking forward to having the conversation. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Jeremy, over to you. Great. Uh, I'm a, a research scientist at MIT in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, the executive director of the Concrete Sustainability Hub. Uh, the hub's about 11 years old, and it's jointly funded by uh, basically industry associations for the cement industry and the concrete industry. And the great thing about that is we get a lot of access to people in the industry who um, are uh, then give us insights on what elements of our research might be useful. Um, we also take really a life cycle perspective in evaluating what are the environmental impacts of, uh, of using concrete. So we look at buildings, uh, pavements, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of things that use concrete. So not just the materials, but also um, in what are life cycle impacts of using those. And actually my specific area of expertise is in how you quantify those uh, life cycle uh, impacts. But of course, having worked in this space, I've learned a lot about buildings and pavements and interacted with people uh, over time who are making those decisions. So looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Jeremy, and uh, welcome. And uh, Arvind, um, please give us a brief intro. Are you still there, actually? Did you drop off by accident? It looked like he was on and then he just yeah. dropped off. So. I, I'm just looking around my screen looking for him. Okay, um, maybe a technical difficulty with Arvind. Um, what I'd love to do is just dive into it here, guys. Now, I see a handful of great questions to the audience. Um, looks like we've got a ton of people in the audience, which is great. Please use the Q&A function. Um, I see some great questions in there already, um, and I'd love to just get through as many of these as we can to get into the conversation. Um, maybe I'll start with the first one, which is sort of like a, a larger framing question. It's from Susan. Shouldn't it only count as negative if the CO2 is from direct air capture rather than flue gas capture? So I think the question it's getting at is we talk about phrases like carbon negative, carbon neutral, maybe you know offsetting emissions. Um, maybe Jeremy, you might be in a good position to comment on this, just given your LCA work. Could you give us a quick uh, sort of distinction about how you think about those two things? And remember the specific question is, can you be truly carbon negative if you're getting CO2 from uh, point source blue capture? Yeah, I think the only distinction that I've really heard of is um, carbon from biogenic sources that are part of more natural carbon cycles, like related to plants and, and agriculture, um, and then essentially carbon that's associated with more anthropogenic uh, activities. Uh, and in this case, um, the CO2, obviously, from, from any type of anthropogenic activity, you know, what usually fossil fuel burning, or in this case, from processes, um, I think we count those as if you can capture those and put those to good use um, or offset them, we're going to look at them the same as capturing them directly from the air. So I think the short answer is, at least in, in my discussions, we don't really distinguish uh, among either of those. Okay. There's a related question, and uh, I'm going to bring Arvind in here. I see his, uh, his name is back on the screen in a moment to introduce yourself, Arvind. But before we do, I'm going to do another question here, which is related. Uh, does the panel see a unit of captured CO2 from industrial emitters differently from a similar unit extracted from the atmosphere in terms of its impact on climate? Um, Tom or Brent, you want to speak on this one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, for us, you know, the stuff that's in the air came from somewhere. And so for us, uh, the impact is essentially the same. One of the things that, that capturing a source is, um, is that it makes it a lot more efficient to be able to bring it into whatever sort, whatever use you're trying to apply it to. And we've got to remember, you know, this thing is, is so big that, that companies are not going to be able to offset their entire emissions. You know, they're not going to try to cover up, you know, the problem that they've created. There are enough other motivations for these guys to reduce their footprints so that, you know, I, I think we, we haven't so far really run into anybody that said, well, you're just covering up for somebody else's problem, which is where most people go. 
Uh, we haven't really run into that because most of the industries we're working with are genuinely trying on all fronts. You know, there is no silver bullet to see they're going to cover up somebody's problem or just eliminate the emissions at the at the front. And there's this transition between where we are and where we're going. Uh, and fortunately, I think with our technology, with Brent's technology, um, you, you know, we'll take it from point source or from air capture. Uh, right now, there's not enough of it. I think that's the biggest problem that we have right now is we can't get enough CO2 to do what we want to do. Let's get Arvind in here. Arvind, um, are you available to join us? Uh, I see your name. I don't want to make sure we're all connected. If you are, we'd love to yeah. just, uh, give us the one yeah, minute intro. Sure. You, how can you come at this project? Yeah, so, so, sorry. Uh... I've been dropping in and out. Internet's been buggy and I've been yeah. dri like is driving. Anyway, um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me, first of all. And, uh, you know, Blue Planet, we talked earlier. I'm a massive fan of what you guys are doing. Um, and the world needs it. It's the only way out. So my uh, background is in genetic engineering. And I started in DBio about six years ago. Um, and I started it with the idea that... Um, that biology is a technology that could actually help avert climate change uh, by rebalancing the equations of life. Um, so that led to investments like meat without the cow, Memphis meats, gel tour, you know, fermenting animal proteins, and then like prime roots making uh, fungi. So a broad spectrum approach to um, solving the problem of climate change. And then I was in Iceland and saw olivine being you know, well, basically, uh, hydrothermal vent CO2 being piped down into the bedrock and turned back to stone and read Ends of the Earth by Peter, Peter Brown and put two things together. And I was like, oh, we should be able to use this technology in order to sequester carbon. And lo and behold, that's already being done. And so we found a company, Carbix, to do. And I have invested in other companies like Nova Nutrients that are using gas offtake um, uh, from industrial emitters and using that to grow bacteria and feed those to fish for aquaculture. So um, there's lots of ways uh, we could attack this problem. We need to all of them. And so I'm, I'm happy to, to join you guys to um, think about solutions. Oh, and I should say about two months ago, I, uh, I left as founder in, uh, of IndieBio and stayed on as a venture advisor and um, joined Mayfield uh, as a general partner, uh, co-leading the engineering biology practice. And so that's exciting because now I can work with later stage companies with larger checks and um, more focus uh, with my time. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Arvind. Glad you could make it. Um, yep. Glad you could be here. Okay. Uh, let's get to some other questions. Um, I had all these, let's, uh, let me just scroll through them and see. All right. I'm, I'm going to try to sort of segment our conversation a little bit. So we're not completely all over the place, but let's get into sort of the nitty gritty of concrete and aggregates a little bit. Um, and then from there, I think we can zoom out to some of the other macro topics. I'm really also keen to get into things like what's the business landscape? How do people get involved? Um, what does change actually look like? Okay, Anonymous says, is there any difference in strength between concrete when the fine aggregate is calcium carbonate versus silicon dioxide? Um, Brent, do you wanna try that one? Yeah, the, uh, you have to remember about 70% of the aggregate used in concrete today is already limestone. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's so many factors that affect this strength, but with regard to Blue Planet's limestone, like the formulations we used when we did Terminal 1 at San Francisco International Airport, uh, we had to meet all the same ASTM specifications, but uh, there are some very high strength concretes, you know, like 15,000 PSI, where they'll use a, a granite substrate, you know, which is a silicate rock, very hard rock, but uh, no, in general, uh, the rock type, which is usually limestone in most concrete, um, is, is just, a, it's a factor in many factors that lead to the, the mechanical properties of the concrete. Here's one, maybe for Tom or Jeremy. What about moving more towards a calcium sulfaluminate? What about, sorry, what about moving more towards a calcium sulfaluminate cement? <laughs> I don't know what that I don't know what that means. I'm hoping what, what one of you guys does actually. 
We'll let we'll let Jeremy do the uh, the okay. chemical answer, and then I'll give you the economic answer. How about that? Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, what I so as I mentioned, you know, my expertise is more on these sustainability assessments rather than material science. But having reviewed enough sustainability assessments, I can say there there are many different what we call alternative clinkers. Basically, uh, the way we make cement is generally you know, digging that limestone out of the earth, mixing it with clay, some other stuff, heating it up. Then we get, uh, you know, a clinker out. Sometimes we blend it with some other materials to get a blended cement. So there are many different ways you kind of change the chemistry of that process uh, by either changing those input materials or changing, um, you know, some of the processing conditions. And actually Tom's company is an example of a, a reformulation of different types of cement. So, um, so having said that, that specific one, I'm not familiar with, um, but, but generally a lot of the, the reason why people, um, why some of those have a harder time getting adopted is uh, availability of raw materials um, and then cost of uh, processing is another one. And then the third um, item would be also sort of maybe uncertainty or, or uh, around how that is going to, you know, then lead to the performance of concrete. So, um, so, so that's, those are all factors that affect those switches. And then maybe I'll, you know, pass it off to Tom, like I said, who's Doing yeah, something. and I think the other thing that um, most people don't recognize with concrete in general is it's a it's a highly localized market. So when you talk about raw materials, uh, you talk about cement, you talk about concrete. Typically, it's not shipped more than about 150 miles anywhere, unless you have water near you. It's just not going very far, and so you've got to find a way to be able to access the raw materials that you need. Uh, as well as the CO2, and drawing that map can get a little complicated. So there, you know, there are going to be different uh, cements that are you know, alternate cements that are really, really good in certain geographies and really, really bad in other geographies. And and uh, the the beauty of Portland cement is it's pretty much everywhere. The raw materials, by and large, are available everywhere in the world. That's what makes them attractive, um, and that's what has has drawn us to it. Is we. we We've got a technology that will basically allow you to do this anywhere. It doesn't matter where, where you are. You can do it anywhere. Uh, the particular cement that you mentioned has got a couple of other issues. Um, it's expensive. And it really doesn't work quite as well. So when we started the company, the first thing I did was find out, okay, why did everybody else fail? And basically, they all fail for the same reason, right? You either needed a big capital investment. You needed raw materials that weren't ubiquitous or you couldn't meet the specifications of the process. And the one thing I would add to that is uh, you didn't have market access. A lot of people kind of thumb their noses at the industry and the industry controls the industry. And if you want market access, um, you've got to find a way to be able to work with them as opposed to against them. Yeah, no, I, I would just second Tom's point there that um, there, there are many issues around commercializing the cementitious phase uh, that, you know, like shelf life, for example, you know, I mean, if it doesn't have several years of shelf life, forget about it. It's not commercializable. And many of the new cements haven't been tested. You know, I have over 150 patents on cement, you know, including the cement orthopedic cement that's in most operating rooms that do orthopedic surgery. And I can just tell you, you know, and I founded Colera and built a big plant to make a really good cement, um, but I've come to the conclusion that the way to address cement is not by throwing out Portland cement and starting over. It's, it's really by just simply capturing the CO2 coming out of cement plants. And if you do that, you've taken care of the whole problem. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm gonna pick up on some of those themes in a minute, but there's a couple other technical questions uh, for Brent actually. So let's hit these real quick. Okay, how practical is Brent's, this is from Toby Bryce, how practical is Brent's quote, ideal mix that includes CO2 injection, CO2 negative aggregate, slag and fly ash? The carbon star rating is great, but what would need to happen to achieve it in terms of incentives, et cetera? And uh, a follow on question is, could Tom or Brent take a stab at quantifying cost relative to a more standard mix? Um, is that question clear to you, Brent? And would you mind? Yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, so the CO2 ejection uh, is from a company called Carbon Cure that uh, 
is out there today uh, providing uh, liquid CO2. So that, that's really out of this, uh, this carbon source standard, which is being published by the Canadian Standard Association. Uh, not by, it's not my it's not my mix design. It's simply showing how the carbon star rating system applies to a lot of different designs, and and by throwing them all together, it was simply to show that these different approaches are not incompatible. You know, you can take a lot of different approaches, and uh, you know they can be additive. If that were a normal weight uh, uh, concrete rather than a lightweight concrete, the contribution from the aggregate would have been a lot different, and uh, you could have been down around negative 700 pounds per cubic yard if you wanted to really easily. Um, with regard to the cost, um, you know, uh, if you look at a, say a ton of limestone, uh, which is 44% uh, CO2 with regard to say a carbon credit, if that's what they're getting at, you know, in California, there's about a $15 carbon credit per ton and 44% of a ton of limestone is, uh, you know, CO2, so maybe it's a $5 credit, whereas that ton of limestone could sell for 50 to $100 in the market. So, you know, it's a mechanism that, that's not really dependent on any sort of subsidy to, to make sense, really. And, and of course, 94% of the world has no carbon subsidies and probably never will. So, you know, it really has to be something that stands on its own. Great. Thank you for that. Um, these are great questions, by the way, audience. So please keep them coming using the Q and A function. Can I just follow up on that one? Of course, Jeremy, go ahead. Um, just to say that um, the example is a great one to show, you know, possibilities of where we can go with carbon. Um, but the the kind of I think the original question was about like how would that concrete perform? And as Brent showed, like almost certainly it would make you know the five thousand psi strength or whatever it was in there. The, the, the tricky thing about concrete is that we design mixtures for many different performance attributes. Uh, you know, so that strength, usually we measure it at 28 days, 56 days, something like that. Um, sometimes strength needs to have, or concrete needs to have high early strength. Sometimes there are uh, other constructability related issues. And so um, the real challenge is that by doing those substitutions, you know, sometimes you affect many of those different factors. And I only bring this up to say, it's not that we can't create, you know, equivalent mixtures that have sort of have the traditional uh, Portland cement with, with these S, uh, SCMs or other things, but just that sometimes that's often the challenge to adoption is demonstrating they have the same performance in all those other categories uh, as well. And, and that to me is actually one of the things we need to probably work at the most in terms of getting alternative concretes, whatever the, the derivation is, is making sure we can demonstrate that sort of functional equivalence across all those different categories. Yeah. yeah you know, Jeremy related to that, you know, it's as simple as having an extra silo for an extra material at the ready mix plant. That, that's a big deal. It is. Yeah, and Marcus, if I could dive in on the cost side, I mean, we, we've just assumed from day one that if it costs more, people aren't going to do it. Uh, and I agree with Brent, you know, if you're if you're waiting for uh, subsidies to make concrete successful, you know, I, I can't hold my breath that long. Uh, and there really are very few in place. So, you know, we've kind of basically we, we've taken the, the, the philosophy from the beginning. Uh, the cement that we make has to use the exact same raw material, same equipment. We just changed the recipe. It actually lowers their cost appreciably, increases their yield, and does all the sustainability stuff with it. You know, Brent mentioned uh, shelf life earlier. Uh, we got stuff we made six years ago that works just as well uh, as it does now. That has a big impact on our ability to kind of launch a new product because you know we can make it in batches, store it, and then have it go up. You know, when you get to the concrete guys, the concrete guys don't have a carbon problem in their minds. And so it really, we had to focus on performance. It had to be on concrete performance and profitability. Uh, we spent more time doing uh, financial analysis on, uh, on the concrete, probably more than anything else. And uh, you know, people have been trying to carbonate this stuff for about 50 years, and they did it for a lot of very good reasons, uh, but they never changed the cement, which is why it didn't really work very well. So uh, the, the focus on, on cost, I mean, all the studies that have ever been done on, on uh, 
on sustainable materials will tell you, even in a place like you know, Sweden, Germany, you know, where they have high value for sustainable products, you might get a 5% price premium if you're lucky and only if your products are equal to or better than. So uh, we just kind of developed a sense of urgency that you know, if we're gonna do this quickly, we've got to fit inside a, a box that's relatively small, uh, but we think we've pulled it off and, and uh, guys are beginning to embrace it. But it's, you know, it's tough sledding, man. These guys, I had, a, I had a very senior leader in a concrete company tell me a couple of weeks ago, he goes, man, I'll die over a quarter of a cubic yard. So don't yep. come in here and tell me it's going to cost more. It just won't work. They won't adopt it. There's no motivation to do that. We don't have enough Leonardo DiCaprio's who will, you know, go buy all the Priuses in the world. These guys are laying concrete and, they, and they're making razor thin margins. And they're just not going to adopt the new stuff on a broad scale quickly enough to have the kind of impact that we want to have. I think that's really true, Tom. I think there's one big transformation going on, though. I think the owners and specifiers, including, you know, like Caltrans in California, are are driving the bus. And and what the what the Carbon Star rating has allowed them to do is when they specify concrete, they're not only specifying five thousand psi, but they're specifying a Carbon Star rating of zero, say. And, and they're ultimately the decision maker. And so I agree with you completely about the ready mix operators. They're operating on penny margins, sort of like the concrete block guys. But if the specifier or the owner uh, specifies a carbon footprint, like say their goal is to have a carbon negative complex, which you know many companies have set goals like that, which they're having to meet. I can give you an example here in Silicon Valley of a very large complex that's recently been launched, the specifier specified a carbon neutral complex. And the, the concrete companies just had to comply or else their bids wouldn't be accepted. So you're seeing that kind of change, which can really come from uh, governments as well in their procurement. Uh, like, you know, we have our Buy Green uh, initiative here in California. If, if governments are specifying carbon negative, carb, low carbon, carbon, uh, sequester concrete in their projects, that's what's going to happen because if they want to bid on the project, they have to meet those goals. Okay, this is great conversation. I want to take it from now to get to some of our other questions into a little bit more on uh, why do people want to buy this concrete? How does it fit into existing concrete markets? How does sort of the business side of it work? Um, there are a lot of questions here and you guys are kind of taking it there. Before I do, I'm just going to answer one question real quick. Um, panel, tell me if this is not the right answer, but I think it is. Christian Butzlaff says, if you inject CO2 into the concrete, how long does it stay? Does it get released back into the atmosphere over time? I think the answer is no. If you make a lime stain or stone or stable carbonate, the idea is it should more or less last forever or at least forever on climate time scales. Yeah, but Marcus, that's like the number one question we get out of European customers. Is it going to come back out? And you have to tell them, no, it gets ripped apart. And unless, you know, we go up to 900 C or so, it's never coming out again. And if that happened, then we all got much bigger problems. Okay. Yeah, probably a small percentage, not, not in Tom's process, but a small percentage is lost, you know, when they're injecting it. But once it forms calcite, you're done. It's the White Cliffs of Dover. It ain't going anywhere. <laughs> The, the only exception to that is, you know, uh, Brent mentioned that there's a, the, the carbon cure process that's being used in ready mix production, at least under currently that's injected just directly into like a, a concrete mixer truck. And because, and they intentionally do that because it's easy to just modify those existing processes, but not all of that CO2 can get directly into the mm -hmm. truck. So because that's not in like a, a, you know, sort of manufacturing facility, like what uh, Tom is using, um, that's different. And I'm not saying that's means it's bad, but it's just because of that, that they, that's how they're currently doing ready mix at least. Um, but once the CO2 does get in there and has that chemical tr uh, transformation, then it's just like they said, it will stay. Okay. Now, People in the audience, keep these great questions coming. I see a lot about incentives, policy levers. I'm not ignoring those, I wanna to get to those in a moment, but let's talk a little bit about the industry and business. Um, 
And uh, this might be a place to bring you in as well, Arvind, I'm sure from IndieBio and other places you have a lot of experience with. We're talking about new technologies, a new innovation space, trying to transform uh, a gigantic and mature industry. Uh, in this case, concrete being one of the most extensive and largest. So there are a couple of questions that kind of get, get at that direction as well. Um, here's one that's a little specific, but I think we can take it more broadly. I think the question I've lost it, but I remember the question was something like, um, limestone mining business is already a significant revenue stream for a lot of companies. Why would they choose a CO2 based alternative? Does that mean they have to give up a new revenue? Maybe I'll, I'll expand the question to, um, how do concrete companies make money doing this? Is this something that costs them that they do because someone says it's a good idea or because they're pressured or how specifically, like what specifically is the business opportunity for, for instance, a larger company to adopt Brent's technology or Tom's technologies or products? Help us understand that. Well, there's two prongs. Um, you know, if I own a cement plant, I'm concerned about that million tons of CO2 I'm putting out every year. You know, and I only have so many options to, to address. If I can just turn it into rock with all the Portland cement I'm sending to the concrete plant, I could also send that CO2 sequestered rock, which is a pretty elegant way for me to deal with my CO2 problem. Um, I, but you probably are, are aware that, you know, that it's really uh, more about transportation. That's how the, you know, it's not about digging rocks out of the ground and making a big margin on the rock. It's about beating the, the delivered price and the transportation. And if you make the rock locally, instead of like in Northern California, where you bring it down from British Columbia, uh, you know, most of the delivered price of the rock is in the transportation. And so that's, that they're like big trucking companies. Okay. Interesting. Um, Arvind, do you want to comment on the sort of the broader challenge of how do you move uh, a gigantic legacy industry? And look, I'll just be a little mean here and say the concrete industry has a reputation for sort of being um, slow and conservative and resistant to change, rightly or wrongly. You know, how do we kind of think about making change or transformative change in a space like that? Well, the customer is going to demand change. I mean, anyone who thinks that the trend line that we've been seeing of uh, climate change and its physical effects um, is just going to go away is high, right? Like there's no chance that we're not going to see more forest fires, more, you know, extreme weather events. There's, and, uh, and it's going to become very simple. I mean, the Indie Bio portfolio is built on this very simple premise, right? Um, if you are Gen X or, or, or Gen Z or millennials and you're seeing what's happening and you're having kids as well, you're going to say, well, what can I do to change this? Simply. Like the answer is going to be not, not much. <laughs> like not much as a consumer. You can, you, but then you start thinking about it and you start seeing news articles and you're saying, whoa, okay, cows are bad for the environment. You're like, okay, well, I could change what I eat. Right? I could eat a couple less burgers a week. Uh, from a cow and maybe switch to plant based. Okay, cool. And that happens when like Kraft Heinz goes, stock gets cut in half, right? Like, because that's the type of shift we're talking about. It's the greatest entrepreneurial opportunity in history is this secular. Um, and when I say secular, what I mean by that is the financial definition, right? Like a large scale macro shift in behavior. Uh, and so, what ends up happening is the entire legacy system of capitalism gets disrupted by a new capitalism, which is catering to a completely new set of demands that will price in externalities. Yeah, yeah, let me pay for those externalities. Um, and no one believes that. Uh, still, to this day, I mean, it's starting to change, right? Like I was talking to a, a green, uh, well, a green plastics company and in Iceland. And I was like, you, you seeing people pay premiums for this stuff yet? And it's like, it's a green tsunami is what his, his phrase was. Um, and this is B2B commodity goods, right? So, you know, I think, and, and why? Because in the end consumer, there will be a premium that will be paid. If not, it will be table stakes. And here's, it all, you know, the business model by which I look at these companies 
you know, it's not going to be build a dam, you know, that's at a premium. <laughs> that, that, you know, like that amount of concrete is going to have an X amount of price and you're going to need to lower the marginal cost. Of but building facades are two to 5% of overall building costs. If you could claim that your building is made of clean concrete, of climate change, you've used climate change to build your, build, your building, that's virtuous signaling that you might want to pay a premium for, right? Because you can't, you could afford a two to 5% building costs. Or like, so like Blue Planet is getting traction. Why? Right? Because that's the early signs of what we're seeing. So I think this business model is ready. And that's what the difference between clean tech 1.0 and this. Clean tech 1.0 was tied to the price of a barrel of oil. So when the price of a barrel of oil collapses, so does the entire industry, right? Um, goes from 150 bucks a barrel to fit to 50 and is done. Bye bye all the biology companies. Um, but here we're tying this, this cycle of clean tech or climate tech, whatever you want to label it, to the number to the amount of CO2 in the air. And that's a completely different, like if that craters, well, cool. We've built, figured out a better way of doing things. Um, and so yeah, I I, you know, I'm a designer um by training along with genetic engineering and as a designer you always go back to the consumer and what is the problem the consumer needs to solve for themselves right um and if there is a problem there so that's what makes the quote unquote this time different and um and so yeah it's it, you, when you say okay i could eat a couple less burgers well i could change what i wear so i'm investing in clean textile companies right um, I could, what else can I do differently? Right. I could change what building I live in. Right. I could change the how. So it's got, and what we were talking about are longer terms, right? I can mm -hmm. change what burger I eat, like within the day, like on a spur of a moment, I could change the shoes I wear every what, three months or whatever. Right. I change the building I live in every five years. So like, that's the mentality and that's the cycle. Anyway. Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, Tom, do you want to comment on this as well or other, you know, how do you, you know, to the extent you get traction with larger companies, why, why do they care? What yeah. do you think they're thinking when they engage? Well, with and I think, I think Arvind and, and Brent are both right. I mean, we're, we, especially since last June, and I'll put a date on it because that's when we really started seeing the change. There's no question that the downstream pull has, has grown and grown and grown. We had a German customer uh, call us in November and said, look, the 16 year old girl from Sweden just made CO2 an issue in Germany and I need to do something now, get over here. <laughs> so we're seeing more and more activity downstream. Governments are specifying, buy greens, all that, that's great. And, and that really does help motivate the concrete guys. And I would argue the, the concrete guys are far more motivated and far more willing to, to uh, adopt and, and, and really move forward with change than the cement companies are. So maybe I'll spend a little bit of time on the, these cement guys. Y you know, a year ago, I had a guy tell me, he said, well, we're just going to pass through all the, these carbon effects and, you know, it'll just go into a higher price and life's good, you know, off we go. Uh, that has completely gone away in the last year. Uh, the rise of ESG, uh, a couple of cement companies getting downgraded because of their exposure uh, to carbon costs. You know, all of a sudden the CEOs of these big cement companies have said, um, okay, I guess we should actually probably do something that's not just annual report fodder. And so we've seen a marked change uh, in the number of cement companies uh, address, uh, approaching us uh, because they're looking for, uh, you know, a real change that they can measure, right? It can't be something that you do a hand wave and it goes on the annual report because people are paying attention. They're going to measure it. You know, the concrete guys really justified based on performance. Um, in, in our case, we've got a very simple chemistry and it allows for better quality, better productivity. Um, it takes care of some of the problems concrete's had for a long, long time. So they really are addressing problems that their customers have had. And just one last story, we did a bunch of market research uh, with one of our partners in the Mid-Atlantic region. And we had kind of, you know, efflorescence, durability, all these concrete things. And then sustainability was the last one on the list. And what we found out in talking to contractors and consumers was that we were dead wrong. 
that the sustainability factor was as important as the number one functional benefit. And it was largely because people, they, they don't know how to get their arms around climate change. And I think Arvind, this is a little analogous to what you were saying. They don't know how to deal with climate change, but they can make the decision to eat less burgers, to buy that concrete that's got the right kind of aggregate in it, to specify something for their yard so they can show their next door neighbor. Uh, and that was a, uh, the owner of the company we were working with said, you know, he goes, I figured everybody would be a tree hugger within five years, but it's happening right now. Uh, in a large part uh, due to the, the tone coming out of Washington, it's actually caused this reaction uh, that's been incredibly favorable in the US. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. The, uh, you know, there's a lot of large organizations setting quantitative goals, you know, so uh, it's not just Microsoft or Amazon, for example, you know, Lafarge Wholesome recently announced their goals for 2030 and 2050, you know, largest cement company, but it's also governments like the state of California, you know, has set very strict goals related to the Global Warming Solutions Act of, getting this state from 500 million tons a year to 400 million tons a year. And I, I, think, I think what they're realizing is they're actually looking at the numbers. You know, the state of California is trying to shave 100 million tons a year off of its total carbon output, right? Well, the state of California also uses about 240 million tons of aggregate every year. And, and to make 240 million tons of aggregate, I need 100 million tons of car 105 million tons of carbon dioxide. So, you know, I, I could get to the state's 2030 goal just by taking the rock they're already buying and bringing in from British Columbia and Mexico and Nevada and make it into limestone and using it in the project. So it's really a matter of scale also that they're getting quantitative about it. Okay. Just like Microsoft has done in their projections. I want to go to Jeremy with a related follow-up question that just came in, and Arvin might want to comment on this one too. Um, we've heard that the oil and gas industry for the last 20, sorry, we've heard, ah, we've heard stuff like this from the oil and gas industry for the last 20 years, and we're only now seeing them start to change. How long do we really think it will take cement, I guess, concrete companies to really buy in, i.e. invest? Uh, Jeremy, you want to comment on this one? And this is great. I, I was just a comment. This allows me to make comment. I was going to build off of what the others were saying as well. I think the thing to keep in mind about the cement and concrete industry is they respond to what their customers are asking for. And the reason I mention that is that when it comes to making decisions about what kind of concrete goes into a project, it's not the cement companies or frankly, really even that much necessarily the concrete companies who are deciding, right? Like let's say for buildings, architects, engineers, contractors, and owners of those buildings are really, you know, um, uh, shaping what, what, what kind of concrete is used there. And so, I, you know, I often say if we're going to make a shift, we need that whole team on board and they need to go to the concrete suppliers and say, hey, we not only have a goal of making sure this concrete keeps our buildings safe and resilient and things like that, we also want it to be low carbon. And I think um, like Tom was saying, they're, they're pretty innovative and ready to go, but you know, then, then they need to also say, here's the cost implications of that. Here's the contractor implications of that. And that's where I think actually the risk aversion is the bigger factor here, right? When all that team, uh, you, you know, if the engineer says, I don't want to be the one making change by myself, right? Because then if it doesn't go well, I'm going to get blamed, right? So having all those people on board, uh, you know, the, the, the cement industry in the U.S., I think, has quite a few products that are lower carbon. They're ready to sell, but a lot of specifiers don't want to use it or aren't ready for it. So that's where I think having this be a larger movement is going to be really key because they want to have... The, they, they want to have coverage that if they if they do something different, they're going to say, we did this together. And I think we want to give them that coverage and they'll be ready to um, respond. And I think there are sort of some easier things we can do right away, but shifting more to this more deeper decarbonization that's going to involve some of these mineralization technologies, that's really going to involve a, a sort of a, a bigger push in order to get there. So I think 
the cement companies, they'll if their customers are asking for it and are ready, you know, to pay for it many in certain circumstances, I think they'll be ready to do it. They, they want to provide a, a product and I think they can do it, but um, but they need that demand. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions directly about, uh, I guess, Solidia and Blue Planet's uh, products. So let's see if we can do these ones quickly and then kind of get back to a broader discussion. Uh, this is for Tom. Susan says, where is Solidia with your ReadyMix testing? So we've got a couple of different uh, products that we're working on right now for ReadyMix. Uh, one of the, the the one that is the furthest along and will be in the market, well, it's in the market now, I guess, is, is really an SCM replacement. You know, Brent showed a, a mix design earlier that had slag and uh, fly ash in it. Challenge in North America in particular is all that stuff's kind of going away. Uh, all the slag in California comes from China. Uh, on the In Texas comes from Turkey and uh and China, East Coast comes from China and fly ash, you know, qualities down everything else. So uh, it just so happens that uh, Solidia Cement, the chemistry works pretty well as an SCM. And if you carbonate it, you know, to Brent's point, if we can carbonate our cement at the cement plant, um, it really not only becomes a, a really good SCM, it becomes a great SCM. So uh, right now we've been doing pours for the last couple of months. You know, just kind of going over the, the initial hurdles, but we'll be in the market pretty quickly with that. So really excited about that. The longer term view of, you know, how do you really turn uh, ready mix concrete into Solidia ready mix concrete? Uh, you know, the problem is you can't put gas into it. Um, with all due respect to the carbon care guys, you know, putting the liquid into the thing just doesn't get enough CO2 in there to really have the impact on the properties that we'd like to see. So we have to figure out a way to introduce it as either a solid or a liquid. And we think we figured out a really cool pathway to get there uh, that actually could get us to a point where uh, it's carbon negative. But, you know, that's that's a that's a okay. five year play, not a not a next year play. OK, a quick one for Brent is Blue Planet Concrete available all over the U.S. today. Can we buy it? Well, to Tom's point, uh, concrete is a, a regional local product. You know, you, unless you're on water, you're not going more than 50 to 100 miles. The, the plant we're constructing in San Francisco Bay is on the Sacramento Delta. So we can get up to Sacramento, down to Silicon Valley and Redwood City by Facebook, to San Francisco and into the North Bay. And uh, there are some projects up in Seattle that we're uh, focusing on as well. But um, there are about five to 7,000 locations around the world that are putting out more than half a million tons of CO2 from a point source. Uh, and if you draw a 50 mile radius around them, you get pretty good coverage of uh, all the urban areas in the world. And by doing like the partnership we just announced with Mitsubishi, which is a heavy industrial company with far outreach, uh, we believe we'll be able to uh, make it available in hundreds of plants more per year, if not thousands, uh, as we go forward. And that's really the scale that's needed to expand this. Okay, thank you. Um, one more quick one. Um, uh, I can't find it, I'll come back to it, let's move on. Okay, there are a handful of questions that have to do with local policy, state policy, and federal policy, and even sort of international drivers. And then there's some other questions more about sort of cost and technology. Um, just because we haven't touched on it too much, let's get into the policy a little bit. Um, the role of government procurement is sort of a strong, and I would say a forgotten story in a lot of innovation in the United States um, and a lot of other places around the world. Government is often the early driver working with uh, initial technology developers, but not the only one. Okay, here's a question from Chris Nidal. Interesting stuff going on in New York State. The New York State Legislature has introduced the Low Embodied Carbon Concrete Leadership Act, LECLA, L-E-C-C-L-A, for the acronym nerds. In both chambers, legislature is considering it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It calls for a climate impact standard for all concrete procured for state-funded projects, special incentive for carbon utilization. Please comment on the importance of government purchasing policies like this one. Um, are they important? Do they matter? Are they most of the driver, some of the driver? Um, how do you think about it? This can be for anyone. 
I mean, I, maybe a, a couple of couple of different perspectives. So uh, there's also a law that's actually going a bipartisan law going through the uh, New Jersey Senate today, actually, uh, that focuses on green green buying. You know, the, I think those things are going to be really important. Um, uh, the the best one that we like so far is one in uh, Rotterdam, where they actually will give you a bid credit uh, if you have a certain level of embodied carbon. Uh, and it really does you know, narrow down the focus pretty quickly. What, 50%, Brent, you'll have to help me with this number, 50% of all the concrete in California is bought by the you know, California, state of California. Um, so yeah. to say that these guys can have impact, um, you know, it, it has a big, big impact. And a lot of it is really tough. You know, everybody's got these goals, these zero goals that they want to get to, but nobody really knows how to do it. So putting these policies a bit ahead of the technology and the volume, quite frankly, we think is going to help pull along the technologies uh, because it really forces our downstream customers uh, to adopt uh, you know, new strategies much faster than they would have normally. Yeah, the ones that are going to really drive things are these revenue neutral uh, mechanisms like the low carbon fuel standard. You know, um, that's why the oil companies have invested in direct air capture and all that. You know, they're getting the LCSF credit of two hundred dollars a ton. That turns their effective price of on oil from fifty dollars a barrel to one hundred and fifty. You know, it's brought them in there. So it's been very, very uh, effective uh, in in driving um, drive, driving the the whole whole market forward. Yeah, if I, if I could just um, comment Thanks. on that, I um, there there's a lot of these different types of procurement bills um, that are being moved through, and I've spoken with Chris about uh, his bill in uh, New York, and which is a, a great example. Um, I think the on its surface, using government procurement to select low carbon products is a great idea. The challenge with concrete comes back to the comment that I made earlier that. Um, you know, not all concrete is the same. We kind of, we can have infinite combinations of the, the constituents that we saw, uh, you, you know, Brent showed and the performance is, is gonna be, you know, slightly different depending on which those mixtures that you put in. So I can create a low carbon mixture that's for this 28 uh, day, you know, strength, um, but you know it might not meet meet the certain job requirements, and so um, so there's still some details that need to be ironed out in terms of how you actually do procurement for concrete. Um, but having said that, I think it can be done. And the great thing is that you know I end up speaking to a lot of people who are putting these things together. They want to do it. They they maybe don't appreciate it at first when it's proposed, but they're learning. And I I think it's something that we 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 can. Uh, we, we can get there. Yeah, and in California, uh, you know, because of the success of the low carbon fuel standard, the next thing on the list is concrete <laughs> after liquid fuels. And the, there's already a low carbon concrete standard being developed uh, here in California that will ha have the same revenue neutral mechanism. Anyone yeah. want to comment on federal policy? Um, not just because there's an election coming up. Um, so that, that was part of a broader question and also read a related question. Um, why aren't government subsidies on the table, says Anthony Wessling. Political will seems to be there. Is it a question of marketing and messaging as to just how significant the mitigation potential is? We could mandate that all highways must be built with carbon sequestration, sequestering concrete, right? So what about government subsidies and comments on the role of federal uh, policy? Uh, you were going to jump in, Tom, but anyone? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, Tom, Tom, then Jeremy. Go ahead, Jeremy. Okay. I, I just think that, um, you, you know, we we have all kinds of examples of subsidies for, um, you, you know, solar power, wind power, things like that. And I absolutely think that if we're really going to do deep decarbonization within this sector, we're going to need those same type of subsidies. And, and that's actually one of my recommendations, usually for those procurement bills, if let's let's include that uh, as well to make sure that we can move the uh, 
needles. So I think that's the key thing. In terms of federal procurement, there is you know, no reason to think of that the GSA, when they're doing construction, that they couldn't take advantage of many of these same policies that states are. So absolutely, I think that should definitely be on the table. Okay. I mean, we, we originally, when we started looking at trying to influence the government to put in subsidies, you know, you run out of money as a startup before that happens. So, uh, but I, I think that that environment's changed a little bit uh, and we're actually seeing some things being put in place, even at a federal level to encourage purchase of, of stuff like ours. I think one of the things that you'll hear a lot of companies and uh, Brent, I don't wanna put you in this basket, but you know, we're, we're both in a position where we've got a technology that we've demonstrated, it works. And the question is, how do you expand it quickly? How do you have access to that capital uh, to be able to make it so that Brent can do his stuff on the East Coast and on the West Coast and, and in Texas, you know? We've got the same challenges. How do you get that, you know, that capital availability to be able to enable some of the things that we've talked about? You know, Brent mentioned uh, putting a silo in a cement plant. There are people that won't adopt new technologies over a hundred thousand dollar silo. I mean, that's where this industry is. And so some of these smaller incremental investments by government could actually go a lot longer way. Um, maybe some of the big bets that uh, people like to place because they like placing the bet on the big shiny ball and concrete's not a big shiny ball. It is, you know, we're concrete in New Jersey, not sexy. Yeah. Okay. One, one, one of the issues right now is, you know, so with a 45Q credit, um, there's a, a protocol in place for the geologic sequestration of CO2 for the $50 a ton. You know, uh, same with CARB, there's a, a, a protocol in place in the California Resources Board under the LCSF for geologic sequestration of CO2. There's not one for carbon mineralization or putting carbon in concrete. So there's an effort now to develop a protocol for carbon mineralization so that, like right now, 45 Qs up in the Treasury Department at the IRS, and the IRS is trying to figure out, well, okay, if 70% of the CO2 injected into the ground stays in the ground, then we'll give them 70% of a credit. You know, and those are the kind of discussions uh, that, that, are, that are occurring right now. But what we're seeing actually is uh, there's a lot of movement, federal, state, provincial, all over the world um, today. But where the real action is, is in the, the, the 40 mayors, the 40 cities, which is now many more than 40 cities. And you can move fast in a city. And, and uh, there's a huge opportunity just, you know, the LA is having the Olympics, like, you know, Paris, the, the mayor of Paris was the head of the 40 cities. And, and you can get stuff done really quickly. You know, when Blue Planet was used at the San Francisco airport, it was specified by name in, in, the, in, the, you know, in their call for proposals. So, so uh, you know, cities can do a lot. And, and move things a lot. Okay, um, we have about 10 minutes left. We still have a strong audience. Uh, so let's move into sort of the lightning round. All that means is I'm gonna keep uh, uh, asking these great audience questions, but I'm gonna ask you all to keep your answers short so we can get through as many of these. Two phrases I wanna key on, and I'd love to bring Arvind in here. One, access to capital. Two, India and China. These themes have come up. Access to capital. Is it really about access to capital? Do we need to make the technology cheaper? But let's go with access to capital. Is there something special or different about this segment, uh, relatively capital intensive in a way? Um, or is access to capital kind of a misnomer? Um, Arvind, just curious your thoughts on that. And, and uh, if, there, if, there's on one, if there's one thing that the world has an excess of is capital. <laughs> It's the one thing on the planet that we actually have more than we need of. Why? Because we could keep printing it. And we do. So, no, it's not an access to capital question. Um, you know, it's, an, it's a consumer demand question. And so I have no doubts that one day it will be mandated. It will be unheard of to produce concrete or anything in a way that is not carbon neutral. Um, the question is, when will that happen? Is it 15 years from now, 25 years from now, or is it two years from now? And venture capitalists are remarkably short-sighted. 
the only one, the only people more short-sighted than venture capitalists are people in public equity markets, right? Like, so like literally, that's the only group that's uh, that that thinks shorter term than a VC. Um, and so VCs will always place money where they think they can get a return within seven to ten years. And so, um, as the Gretas, as the young generation continues to voice um, their demand for change and and for products that can change the way things are, VCs will continue to pour cash into those areas. Um, you know, it's it's really like that's that's where it's coming from. So like from green steel, like there's green steel companies now, right? Like um, to green concrete, to new ways of feeding our fish, right? Like, like I mentioned, right? To the new ways of feeding ourselves, all using um, carbon, methane. Someone asked about methane. Is, yes, there's methanogens that can be feedstocks, things like that. So anyway, um, it's a lightning round. So that's it. Okay. <laughs> India and China two of the largest concrete and cement markets in the world, I think. Um, what are the prospects for getting these types of solutions deployed there? Is it already happening? Does something need to change? Is it just a matter of time? How do you think about that? Um, maybe, maybe I'll ask Craig to comment on this one. Or Tom, you're ready. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, a, a quick thing. So uh, I think the Chinese have figured out that to be competitive in a, in a constrained resource market, uh, you better figure out how to adopt sustainable technologies um, they are, they, there are things coming along in China in the next couple of years for the cement and concrete market combined with, you know, the Belt and Road combined with the fact that they're almost 60% of the global concrete market. Uh, they have figured this out. They've got some very aggressive programs that are going to be coming out quickly. Uh, India is going to, going to catch up eventually, but they still have an industrialization of that industry that has to occur as well. So, uh, China is, is going to place a big bet on change in concrete, and I think we're going to start seeing some of the results of that very quickly. Yeah, I, I would just say uh, <laughs> Blue Planet's uh, partnership with Mitsubishi Corporation is focused on China and Asia. I mean, that's, you know, other places in Asia, too. But, um, you know, we, we recognize that's the big nugget. And we need to get out there in not just a few places, but many, many places. And it's going to take that kind of industrial partnership to get out there and do that. Hey, I see a question come in. Um, is there a way to test new concrete formulations at scale to address the performance market barrier? Um, I'll, I'll just step in here. I'm going up to Calgary next week because uh, in the Carbon X Prize, they were in our testing phase now. We have a couple of companies making concrete and part of what I'm going to do is gather a few cylinders because we're going to crush them, uh, which is sort of like a, a standard strength and uh, compressive strength test that we do in, in the industry. Um, okay, I'm going to keep... Okay, can we're can I say, you know, with a lightning yes, answer to that, the, the biggest challenge though is demonstrating durability of different solutions. Because obviously durable concrete, you don't want to wait around decades to find out how durable it's going to be. So although you can do that, those short-term strength, uh, you, you know, developing new new methods to do those long-term durability tests in a short amount of time is a big opportunity. I have some gray hairs spent trying to think about how to do uh, durability <laughs> testing in a short time scale, <laughs> which sounds like an oxymoron. Um, Okay, we have permission to go a little bit longer. We're gonna transition into breakout rooms after 7.30 for people that still have time and wanna hang around and discuss. Um, let me say we'll take an extra five minutes to go to 7.35 in the main session, if panel is okay with that. Um, I know we're into the evening, so I appreciate this. Um, here's kind of a different one, interesting. Siva Upalapati says, are there carbon capture technologies at consumer level? For example, you can have rooftop solar. Uh, is there anything at the home or car size that can use to, I guess, capture and maybe use CO2? Um, anyone want to comment on that? Anything out there? Is that relevant to concrete? Yeah, we, uh, we actually developed a bag product with one of the large concrete companies. So, you know, I mean, actually, if you go to a, co a country like Indonesia, for example, about 60% of the concrete comes in bags you know, not from ready mix trucks because of transportation, but yeah, we developed a bag product. Uh, it's a lightweight concrete so the weekend warrior can uh, get it out of their trunk 
and uh, but it's carbon negative. Okay, interesting. Uh, also a different question. Uh, most of the R&D for CO2 conversion is focused on catalyst or the conversion process itself. But do the panelists want to comment on other types of hardware or equipment design that are relevant to this space? Is there in, are there innovative equipment designs maybe in sort of balance of systems that can help bring down costs or energy requirements or sort of drive up other efficiencies? Any thoughts on that? I mean, just just the, the whole idea of how the heck do I get the CO2 to the cement there, that I'm trying to convert or the or the chemistry that I'm trying to convert, whether it's a powder, a solid, uh, you know, whatever it is, um, that's probably where we spend most of our effort is really trying to find optimized ways of, of getting that CO2 next to that uh, cement so that they can uh, make some magic. Yeah, one of the fundamental differentiators is a lot of the efforts have depended on having to purify CO2 so it can go to the next step in the process as a, as a liquid or a compressed product. But, you know, 99.9% .9 of all the carbon on the earth doesn't do that. It, it just is absorbed through the ocean to form carbonate without that waste of energy. And, you know, putting a lot of energy into trying to purify concrete, purify CO2 so that you can do something else with it. It isn't necessary and it's a hangover from you know ccs and all our beliefs that you had to first get it to a liquefied form but it's not necessary and it's a huge waste of energy that you know won't be part of the largest solutions amen we want dirty co2 yeah that's another good point tom is uh you know, when we start talking about criteria of pollutants, you know, like SO2, for example, or even mercury and lead and other things, um, they're, they're sequestered permanently, uh, insolubly in in the, in the concrete. And it, it's, a, it's a whole other aspect to this whole field is emission control. Okay, this one might be for Jeremy. Can you address the issue of embodied carbon versus life cycle carbon? If I build a building or a pavement that has X units of carbon, but in the use phase, I save two X units over 10 years. How do we account for this? How do you value those trade-offs between, I guess, savings today uh, versus savings over the product uh, lifetime? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's an excellent question. And certainly we obviously, we don't make concrete just to have it sit around. We use it in our buildings and our pavements. And so thinking about how it actually contributes to the life cycle impacts of those structures is really important. So for example, in buildings, most of the environmental impact of buildings is gonna be associated with the operational energy consumption, cooling and heating that building. So if you can, if you can design a building that minimizes that, that uses the materials in the structure to minimize those, those operational impacts, that can be a, you know, a quote, sustainable building, even if you're using a high, even if that has a high embodied impact. Now, the great thing about the solutions we're talking about here is that you can lower the embodied impacts of the materials while also uh, using the concrete to lower, say, the, the uh, energy consumption of the buildings. So, um, and indeed, I'd say, you know, the architecture community for a long time or building community focused on lowering energy consumption. And it's really in the past few years, they said, now we need to also shift to this uh, embodied carbon. And so, which is just associated with production of the materials. So finding ways to do both is important. Yeah, you know, and along those lines, uh, one of the great innovations of some of these new tech uh, interventions is they change the albedo of the concrete. And, uh, you know, the solar reflectance is a huge factor in what Jeremy's talking about. Okay. Um, when I speak on the topic, sometimes I say uh, things like, we need this sector because, believe it or not, electricity is probably easier to decarbonize than our heavy industry. And we really have no good solutions to decarbonize things like concrete, glass, manufacturing from an energy perspective. David Ham says, what are the alternative energy sources, specifically alternatives to fossil energy for things like cement clinkers uh, or other, I guess, like high temperature type manufacturing? Um, any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you right now, basically to produce cement, you need fossil fuels, uh, you know, the, uh, um, 
Well, let me take that back. You need uh, 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 a carbon dense materials. And so that's usually going to be uh, often it's coal, but uh, now there's a shift to natural gas. The, the other uh, 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 fuel stream though is becoming what they call alternative fuels. And these are often waste fuels like tires and uh, other forms of waste as well. But generally, you know, the temperatures in a kiln are 1500 degrees C. There's one study that's looking at potentially electrifying, you know, cement plants, but it's just so far in the future. And so, so Marcus, you hit the nail on the head that at least right now, that's one of the unique things about these industrial processes is that decarbonizing them is a particularly big challenge. And the, the alternate fuels are becoming a big, big deal. Uh, I will say because we actually lower the kiln temperature, it makes it a lot easier for cement companies to use far more alternate fuels. And this is junk that we would put into landfills or otherwise wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't have really any use. So um, that, you know, it, it, it's this multi-pronged appro approach and the idea is you have to do it all, you know, to get to where we want to go. You have to do everything. Okay. Even if you were to electrify it with the solar bulbs we have in California every day, uh, the fundamental chemistry of sintering clinker puts off CO2. So, you know, and that's half the story. So uh, you're always, always going to need to capture CO2 from cement plants. The energy is yeah. only about a third of the overall footprint. So That's a great point. We often think of energy as synonymous with CO2 emissions, but um, you know, that's, that's just not always the case. Okay. We thank you for going over time. I'm going to ask one last question. First, I just want to acknowledge there are a lot of fantastic questions in the Q&A that we haven't had a chance to get to. We're kind of overflowing with questions, which uh, I'm sad we can't get to all of them, but I think it's a testament to this great panel today. Um, there will be uh, some breakouts. I'll hand it to Nathan to explain how that works if we want to continue the convo. But let's just zoom out for a second. And this is for the whole panel. We're talking about a new industry, a growing industry with massive growth potential to solve one of the greatest challenges on earth in one of the largest existing industrial sectors. A lot of great ingredients are there. If you're speaking to a young person or an investor or just anyone that's interested to get into the space, uh, what are one or two pieces of advice you might give them? Um, and we can go around the horn on this. Maybe I'll ask uh, Arvind to kick it off. What would you suggest for someone that's thinking, wow, I love this panel, You know, I wanna get involved. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I get started? So, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, um, you could be involved. And whether you're an accountant or a chemist, a chemist, right? There is a place for you in a company or a place for you to start a company um, to be involved in, in getting these types of technologies to market. And so I think that's the key and it's, it's easy to like always talk about the scientists or always talk about like the, you know, the CEO and things like that, but like anyone could be involved um, literally and make an impact and make a difference in, um, in these types of companies. So I would say go, you know, do some quick Google Kung Fu, um, find uh, you know, a list of companies that you think are interesting and, um, and talk to them, you know, startups are incredibly easy to contact. Um, you generally just email someone that their email on the website. They're designed to be easy to reach, you know, um, and you can and you can get to someone that will uh, usually the CEO. Um, and so I think like that's one place to start if you are a scientist or if you are a um, entrepreneur that wants to start a company. The world is literally swimming in in money. Um, you won't have to try super hard to find a venture capitalist that will listen to you um, and then refine your pitch and uh, and re you know refine what it is the business model of what you're trying to do and um, and you know you can right now is probably you know it's, it's not just the greatest oppor entrepreneurial opportunity in history it's probably a moment in I'm talking about all like going back to Roman times right like um, that much money and um, and optimism really for these new technologies. Uh, so yeah, now's the time to do it. I love the vision. Um, Jeremy, you want to, uh, what would you say to somebody that's interested to get more active here? 
Yeah, I think the more that I say sustainability, the more I think it's almost entirely about behavior change. And that maybe seem, seems obvious when we talk about recycling or vehicles and commuting. But in this case, the behavior change is really on the part of those people that are specifying the concrete. And like I said, that often ends up being engineers um, uh, contractors, folks like that. Now for them to really, and, and as I said, when it comes to concrete, the stakes are high, right? So I understand risk aversion when it comes to making change, but they, but, but obviously when it comes to climate change, we can't afford to just wait for these things slowly to happen. Um, so the number one thing is just how do we create more demand for these products? And that usually is going to come from owners. Owners asking specific, they know now to ask for a green building, but a green building doesn't necessarily, the people associate that with lead, right? They need to get more specific now saying, what's the embodied impact of materials? So when owners start asking that, that'll filter to the architect, to the engineer, the contractor. Um, so in my town, we're redoing our high school. I got involved asking those questions. Now, now that whole process is, is taking place. And that's a little bit unique maybe, but people can start asking those questions about projects that are happening in their town. That's the kind of thing I think that creates nudges that lead to then the behavior change. I love it because uh, it makes it local too. Uh, Brent, you want to go and then last word to Tom? Oh, sure. I, I would just tell young people, go find what inspires you. You know, Blue Planet's a small company, but most of the people here came to us, you know, and you'd say, why would you leave that great job you have? And they say, because I know what you're doing. I think it's going to change the world. And that's where I want to be. And whatever that is, you know, if it's in government, whatever, university, a startup, you know, don't be shy. Go out and just find it and do it. I love that. Tom? Yeah, and I think it's an environment, and just, just to be additive, it's an environment that really didn't exist a couple of years ago for people that really wanted to get involved. If you just look at our company, we don't just hire material scientists and civil engineers. Our last couple of hires were data analysts, programmers, sensor guys, people that know how to deal with artificial intelligence. So there is a role for everybody in this, uh, in what we think is going to be a revolution for this market, um, whether whether it's uh, with our companies or in a way to influence the demand or the environment that's around it. So it really is a space for everybody. It's all around us. We just all take it for granted. And I hopefully that time's coming to an end. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, really generous of your time and your thoughts and your passion today. Uh, I'd love to take it over, hand over to Nathan to uh, close out the session. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you again to all of our panelists. And uh, this was a topic that I think was super exciting and relevant. And I think it hugely lived up to expectations. Um, I'm hoping many of you can stick around. I'm going to stick around. We're going to have to move to another Zoom meeting. and. This is a technical limitation of the webinar feature in Zoom that we cannot do breakouts in the same Zoom meeting. So we have tried to make this as seamless as possible, and I will give you the URL that does so. Um, but on the spirit of getting involved, you can also get involved in as a volunteer with VLab. We have our next planning meeting, uh, not usually the first week of the month on a Tuesday. This, because of the election, will be the subsequent week on November 10th. Uh, you can find that at vlab.org um, and come and just participate. It will be a much more freewheeling chance to meet the members of the community who put on these types of events. And you yourself could lead the next uh, clean tech and environmental oriented event or something totally different that you see as a disruption. Um, and a huge thank you to all of our supporters and sponsors again. Um, and uh, please consider uh, donating. And also, if you know someone who would love to be a sponsor, we are always looking for our sponsors for next year.